Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. So wonderful to have you here. I'm so glad to be here uh, in this room with you and having the opportunity to deliver this information once again. And I'm real excited about it because I've got a whole bunch of new stuff to talk about. So I'm going to kind of walk you through a little bit of uh, the way I discovered this information and the way I came across it, my logic through it, and the path I took. And if I walk you through the same path I took, you'll see that it actually is a very simple path. It's a very simple way of thinking. Uh, it's very fundamental and very simple axioms that um, just needs very little adjustment in our current physics and science and so on to generate just a little bit of a different picture that opens doors to a whole new way of being. And so although this information may seem quite complex, um, it actually, uh, you know, is very accessible to everyone. And I teach this to seven years old and um, to 80 years old, and everybody can get it. So keep your mind open, keep your heart open, and we'll go from there. So it really started when uh, I was approximately nine years old. I could have been 10 or nine, but I remember very distinctly. Um, this first lesson at school. And interestingly, I found that many other people had the same kind of hick when they, when they got into this first lesson. It was the first lesson in geometry. And the teacher went to the blackboard and said, today we're going to learn about geometry. And the first lesson in geometry is dimensions. And I got really excited because I had all these incredible world that I was living in, in my head. And I had all these interaction with all these other dimensions in my head. And, and I thought, oh my God, this teacher is going to talk about this for the first time ever. I'm going to have an adult that talks about this. And I got really excited about it. And I got so, so disappointed. Uh, it wasn't at all what I expected. The teacher went to the blackboard and made a little dot. And he placed beside the dot uh, dimension zero, zero D, and said this is, the, is a dot that represents a dimension that does not exist. And um, I was already confused. I'm like, oh my God, this is not looking good. I'm probably going to fail this class <laughs> um, because I could see the dot. And he was telling me that it didn't exist. And so already I had a problem with that fundamental axiom. And really, this is so crucial. This is so crucial to our understanding of reality. It, this very fundamental axiom of dimension bleeds into advanced physics, advanced mathematics, and all sorts of sciences, and really changes the picture of the way we see things if you know it's not accurate. So I, I didn't know all this, but I thought, well, I can see the dot, but if you say it doesn't exist, uh, I'll just go with that. And then he said, well, uh, because it doesn't have volume, um, it doesn't exist. So if you put a bunch of dots together and make a line, you still don't have volume. We'll call that dimension one. And that doesn't exist either. And, you know, I just kept on going with it. And I could see the other kids in the class were a little bit puzzled about what was going on. And then eventually... He put four lines together to make a plane, called it dimension two, and said that didn't exist either. It still didn't have volume. It was a two-dimensional flat plane. 
And, you know, I could see, uh, he, he used the example that the cartoons in our cartoon books didn't exist, right? And so I could see a lot of the kids were very disappointed. And then he did something extraordinary, something miraculous, uh, something that even puzzled me further. He, he took six planes, put them into a cube, and called it 3D, and said, that dimension exists because it has volume. And I could see that everybody was like, okay. Um, there was a problem in logic there. Turns out that I found out much later that Buckminster Fuller had exactly the same problem in his, uh, school, um, in his schooling in his first lessons in geometry. There was a problem there because if you have a dot that doesn't exist, that makes a line that doesn't exist, that makes a plane that doesn't exist, then you cannot get existence out of six non-existing planes. So what you get is some unknown feature that could only be called non-existence to the fourth. <laughs> Not existence. And so here, fundamentally, there's an issue. And that issue has to do with our understanding of how reality emerges, how dimensions are generated, and how we can get existence, reality, atoms, objects, things in space, and how we solve the equations that describe how these things in space come through, how they get here. That is very fundamental. I didn't know all this at the time, but I knew that this principle that was being demonstrated to me was not quite correct. There was definitely improvements that had to be done to it. And I really felt like I didn't want to spend another day going through my life not knowing what a dimension was. So I decided I was going to solve this. And, you know, I had this long bus ride uh, going all the way back home. It was like an hour and a half from that school. And the reason for that is because I kept on getting kicked out of the schools that were closer to my home. So I kept on having to go further and further. And somebody told me, a physicist told me once, that I was furthering my education that way. <laughs> and uh, he was right, because I had all this time to think in the bus. So I was in the bus, and I was thinking about this problem. And I decided I was going to solve that problem before I got out of that bus. And I didn't realize that this problem had been discussed and, and worked on by many philosophers throughout the ages and so on, all the way down to the Pythagorean schools. I just wanted to solve it right there and then. And so I was thinking and I was thinking and the bus was getting fuller and fuller and I was getting hotter and hotter and it was really, you know, becoming uncomfortable. So I closed my eyes and in my mind's eye, I escaped the bus so that I would feel more comfortable. And I start to see that the bus would, uh, as I rose above it, the bus would become a dot. And then I rose further and I saw the earth becoming a dot. And then I rose further and I saw the solar system becoming a dot. And I rose further again and I saw the galaxy becoming a dot. And then I start to fly back in into the galaxy, into the solar system, back to the Earth. And I located the bus I was in and back into that bus and back into my body. And I opened my eyes and I looked at my hand and I thought, oh, maybe I could fly into my hand. And so I closed my eyes again and I thought of flying into my hand and I saw that inside my hand would be dots that are called cells and then Inside those cells, I would see millions and millions of other dots that are called atoms. I probably didn't even know what an atom was at the time. 
And I continued in and I saw, you know, the nuclei of an atom that was made out of smaller dots and then again smaller dots and so on. And I thought, and, and then I got it. I had this moment of elimination. And then in the bus, you know, going back from school, oh yes, the only solution to this riddle, the only way you can solve this, the only way you can, um, the, the only way you can visualize, understand dimension is if you'd make the exact opposite uh, axiom right from the, the beginning, which is that the only thing that exists is the dot. So here, within the dot is all dimensions. Within the dot, we have all the structure of space-time. Within the dot, all possible other dimensions became, po became in existence. That's the way I saw it, meaning that if we continue to divide the dot, we could find smaller and smaller and smaller dots, and those would be like scales of dimensions. And that the only thing that exists is the dot. And it is only from your perspective that you define the scale at which you observe those dimensions. I mean, that was a completely different view, definitely. And I thought, well, if the dot, if zero dimension is all dimension in one, then that would mean that everybody that I'm looking at in this, bo in this bus has all the dimensions, all the structure of space-time compactify in every dot. I mean, I wasn't thinking in terms of space-time, but I was thinking in terms of fractal dimensions. I didn't know fractals, but I had defined it in my head. And I got really excited. I was walking on a cloud. I got up in the bus and I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh my God, I think I got it. Everything is a dot. Every, every dot has infinity within it. Everything can be divided to infinity. And these dots to infinity, infinitely big, infinitely small. We're living in a big dot that has little dots in it and little dots in it. And I was seeing dots everywhere. <laughs> it was really exciting. And I, I, you know when you have a revelation, you want to tell someone, right? So I didn't know who to talk to. I wasn't going to talk to the bus driver, you know. Or, and so I, I ran home when I got out of the bus and... And I was waiting for my mom to get back from work. And when my mom came in the door, I'm like, Mom, Mom, I figured out something at school today. It's really exciting. And, oh, my mom was so excited because she thought, Oh, my God, you finally are, are doing good at school. Oh, my God. That's a... and, then, and then I started to tell her about this. And I, I'm telling my mom, you know, I think you have a dot inside of you that has all the dots and infinite dots inside and all this. And my mom is looking at me with a look of despair. <laughs> <laughs> the look of an Italian mother in despair. There's a force in that that hasn't been calculated yet. <laughs> and so... She kind of could see it, but she knew it wasn't part of my curriculum at school, and she told me that. And she said, you know, if you answer that in your exam, it's probably not going to go well. And she said, anyway, right now, I just worked eight hours, and I don't feel infinite. And when she said that, it rang a bell. I mean, it, she made a point. She made a very important point. I, I, I stopped and I had to think about it. It's like, well, if it's true that infinity is, is compactified in every point, how is it that we have finite boundaries? How is it that things are not just falling into each other to infinity? And how is it that things exist? How do we define those boundaries? How do we have a finite space in an infinite potential, how can that be together? 
I didn't know at the time, but actually I was tackling one of the fundamental difficulties in advanced physics. The difficulty of dealing with infinities and singularity, which is really the crux of unification at this time. I, it took me back. I had to think about that one. I was like, oh, I got to go back to the blackboard. On, I, I got to think about this before I talk to anybody else. <laughs> but eventually it came to me. And it took a very long time. Uh, I was much older by the time I realized. But all the way through my childhood, there was a few things that came through to help me deepen my belief that I had found something very crucial. Was I the first one that came to this conclusion I have these ideas being around before? Absolutely. Okay? Other people have thought about this. Even our, you know, Big Bang Theory says that everything came out of a point the size of a Planck's distance, which is extremely small, billions of times smaller than an atom. <laughs> 